Hey guys, so this video is going to cover a uh, lesson on the rate of change and basically the slides that you're about to see were taken from your Algebra Nation workbook. The pages that you would need would be pages 95 to 103 from the Algebra Nation workbook. Uh, it's not essential that you have these pages out. You could very easily have a separate sheet of paper and just write down the problems as we go through them or work them out on that piece of paper. Um, either way though, let's just get right into it and however you want to take notes on this, take notes or just rewatch the video later and you'll get it all then. But alright, a quick review of what we're going to be discussing here. Uh, whenever you are dealing with the rate of change, you are dealing with lines that are graphed on a coordinate plane. And whenever you have lines graphed on a coordinate plane, you are dealing with slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. And you are also possibly getting standard form, ax plus by equals c, where a and b are coefficients and c is a constant. But all right, let's just get into a practice problem so you can understand what rate of change is. Uh, Genesis reads 16 pages of The Fault in Our Stars every day. Zuli reads 8 pages every day of the same book. Represent both situations on the graphs below using the same scales for both graphs. So, uh, let's have Genesis be the left graph in green and Zuli be the right graph in blue. We are being asked to represent both of these graphs with the same scales. That's what it says right here, the same scales scales. Here's what that means. If we have days be our x-axis and pages read per day be our y-axis, well, when it says the same scales need to be used, that means you need to be counting by the same uh, pattern of numbers for both the x and y-axis. So as you can see for the y-axis, I'm counting by eights in both of these. And for the x-axis, we are going to count by ones going up to four. As you can see, there are four marks on each uh, x-axis on both graphs. So that's what it means when it says the same scale. Because for rate of change, you want to make sure you're comparing the lines you're going to graph on, on graphs that are equivalent. So here we go. Uh, when Genesis is reading on, the, uh, on day zero, she hasn't read anything yet. So that's why the first dot here would be at zero comma zero. If, she hasn't, if, if no days have passed, then she hasn't read any pages. The next point, though, after one day, she would have read 16 pages, meaning after two days, she would have read 32 pages. So there is our line representing the amount of pages that she reads. Now we get Zuli. Uh, basically, same idea. After zero days, zero pages would have been read. After one day, eight pages would have been read. So that is why we have our first dot right there at one and eight. And then, uh, oh, there's the zero, zero dot. Uh, and then again, when two days have passed, 16 pages have been read. Three days have passed, 24 pages have been read. You just keep increasing the pages per day by eight. And as you can see, we now have a line that isn't as steep as Genesis's uh, line. And it makes sense. Genesis was reading more pages every day. So her line is going to have a steeper slope, a steeper rate of change. Let's look at another example. Uh, Aaron loves cherry coke. Each mini can contains 100 calories. Jacoby likes to munch on carrot snack packs. Each snack pack contains 40 calories. Represent both situations on the graphs below using the same scales for both graphs. So again, let's have Aaron uh, be on the left. Jacoby will be on the right. Uh, basically, again, we want the same scale on both of these graphs. So even though Aaron is dealing with a, uh, a, a mini can container and uh, and Jacoby has snack packs both of those would be our x-axis because it's uh, it's it's one mini can of cherry coke or one snack pack so they're counting by intervals of one and then the y-axis will be calories but again we want to have the same scale for both of these graphs so as you can see I'm going to count by 40s right here we're gonna count we're gonna count by 40s and then on the x-axis, we will count by ones again, just like on the previous problem. Aaron loves uh, the, the Cherry Coke mini cans, and they are 100 calories a piece. So one mini can would be 100 calories. And as you can see on the uh, y-axis, we have uh, 80 being represented right here, and then 120 right there. So that means 100 would be in the middle of, of those two. In any case, um, after one snack pack, 
Aaron has had 100 calories, so after two snack packs, he is at 200 calories. So there is his line, there is his rate of change. Jacoby, uh, same deal. After no snack packs, he has had uh, zero calories. After one snack pack, he is at 40. And then all of the uh, all of the other points you can see right there. We're just counting by 40, and then each additional snack pack uh, adds an additional 40 calories. So uh, after one snack pack, we're at 40. After two snack packs, we're at 80, and then 120 so on and so forth. So basically, again, Aaron, whose uh, snacks had more calories, resulted in Aaron having a steeper slope. And as you can see right down here, that is the rate of change. We were finding the, the speed at which both of these situations were changing. So when it says the rate of change, the word rate is talking about the speed. How quickly does this change occur? All right, let's look at another example. Uh, we can also find the slope by looking at the change in y over the change in x, or the rise over run, something that should be fairly familiar to you. Uh, basically, we're, when we're asked what is the slope of the following graph, what does the slope represent, what you would want to do is first find, oh, whoops, let me just back this up a second so you can see, uh, you want to make sure you are locating the spots on the graph that you can perform the rise over run uh, line thing with. And you will need dots, like where uh, the line crosses through the coordinate plane, sort of like grid area. Um, so the corner of these, of these coordinate plane boxes, that's where you want to look for wherever you can place these dots. And in order to find the, uh, the rise over run, you simply start at any one of your dots, and you rise to the height of a second dot. It could be above or below. And then you run to that dot. So you kind of create this little triangle picture right here. You have your rise. You have your run. We rose 50. We ran 1 to uh, the next dot. So that means your slope is 50 over 1. Uh, take note of the fact the y-axis is counting uh, miles right here. So we do have uh, 50 to 100. That would be an increase of 50. That's where I got that 50 from. And then between 1 and 2, that is a span of one number. So again, our rise was 50, the run was 1, and that means the slope is going to be 50. Uh, but the second question, what does the slope represent? Well, it says we have miles for the y-axis and hours for the x-axis. So that means this is miles per hour. This is a speed. This is uh, a car is driving on the highway or something. So 50 miles per hour would be the, uh, the representation of the slope. And then again, just to show you in red, uh, another way you could have gotten the same answer, you don't have to start at the two dots that I started at. You could have picked any two dots to do the rise over run maneuver with. As you can see, I rode 200 right here and then ran 4 so that would create 200 over 4 and 200 over 4 would simplify to 50 so same thing all right, another example. Uh, basically right here whoops too much happened right there. Uh, consider the following graph as you can see we have uh, the dots already set up and we are being asked what is the rate of change of the graph. So in this problem, as you can see, the dot in the middle uh, that I'm starting from right here, when you do your rise, you go from a height of 6 to a height of 12, so that is a rise of 6. And then the run, uh, from where I chose to end, uh, right there, that is going from 2 to 4, so your run is just covering a distance of 2. So basically, your rise is 6, your run is 2, your slope is 3, and that is the rate of change. When it asks you what does the rate of change represent, again, just look at your x and y axis to make that, to make that determination. Uh, it says days of vacation is the x axis, and souvenirs purchased is the y axis. So that means three souvenirs are purchased every single day. That is the rate of change. Alright, in this question, uh, Freedom High School collected data on the GPA of various students and the number of hours they spend studying each week. A scatter plot of the data is shown below with the line of best fit. Uh, again, as we go through these next questions, pausing the video and trying to answer it before I explain it is a good idea just to help give you the practice. Uh, so, in any case, moving on. Uh, the question A, what is the slope of the line of best fit? You gotta get kinda close to find some dots, but again, that's all you're looking for. Uh, 
uh, dots that are on those corner spots of the coordinate plane, and then you just do rise over run. So in this particular case, the uh, the rise was 0 0.5, or the starting point of our rise right here was at 0 0.5, and then I ended it at 1.6. So that means you uh, subtract those two numbers, and the rise was 1.1. That's how that's how far up this line went. 1.1. And then the run started at 0 and it ended at 6, so that means the run was 6. So your rise is 1.1, the run is 6, 1.1 over 6, you would want to divide those two numbers. When you deal with uh, rate of change and, and slope like this, you want to make your, uh, your numerator not be a decimal. So you want to divide by 6 so that you get 0 0.183 with a bar over it. Even though that's still a decimal, uh, it's a unit rate, like this number would be over 1 if you were to put it in a fraction form, so it's okay that it's a decimal. Uh, and then the second part of the question, what does the slope represent? Well, uh, again, this is a graph relating GPA to hours spent studying each week. So that means one hour of studying each week will help your GPA go up by about 0.183 bar units. Um, so studying is a good idea, that is what this is basically concluding. All right, number three. Uh, Sarah's parents give her $100 allowance at the beginning of each month. Sarah spends her allowance on comic books. The graph below represents the amount of money Sarah spent on comic books last month. Uh, what is the rate of change? That is question A. Again, take two dots. I'll take the very two top dots. It's starting at 100. It's going down to 95. That is a rise of negative 5. And then from 0 to 1 is a run of just 1, as you can see on the x-axis. 0 to 1 is right there. So what is the rate of change? Well, uh, decreasing by 5 would be the numerator, minus 5, and that would be over 1, rise over run. So um, negative 5 over 1 is the rate of change. Part B, what does the rate of change represent? Well, if she is losing $5, then that means the comic books purchased is going to uh, deduct money from her allowance. So she is spending $5 dollars per comic book. That's what the rate of change represents. Very important to always make sure you are understanding what the rate of change is representing because that's a very reasonable question you could get on the end of course exam. All right, let's look at some other practice problems. Again, pausing the video and doing it before I explain it is a very good idea. Uh, a cleaning service cleans many apartments each day. The following table shows the number of hours the cleaners spend cleaning and the number of apartments they clean during that time. And as you can see, we have a table and it says part A represent the situation on the graph below. So, we need to set up our x and y axis. Uh, the x axis will be the time it takes in hours, and then the y axis will be the apartments cleaned. And it seems very logical that time being the first unit in the table will be our x axis, and then the apartments cleaned is a function of the amount of time it takes. Um, so, time is your independent variable, apartments is your dependent variable. And as you can see, our time is represented from 1 to 4 hours, so I did that right here on the x-axis, uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then on the y-axis, we would count 2, 4, 6, 8. And then plot all the points, and then there you go. Notice how I'm not going to exactly connect the line because the table stopped at, uh, at 4 and 8, so we're just going to kind of end it right there and, and let this just be the answer. Oh, never mind. We're going to find the slope as well. Uh, basically, a rise of 2, a run of 1, um, that would be your slope. So uh, two apartments were, were, were cleaned in, in each hour. That's what it represents. Uh, Alright, part B. The data suggests a linear relationship between the number of hours spent cleaning and the number of apartments cleaned. Assuming the relationship is linear, what does the rate of change represent in the context of this relationship? Uh, so when it says assuming the relationship is linear, uh, we're just referring back to this problem, so I'll just jump back for a second. Uh, as you can see, we have a straight line and that's what makes it a linear relationship. If we had a line that was curved, then that's not linear, because the line is curved. Yes, they are both lines, but when it says, is your graph linear, is it a straight line? If it's just a graph, it could be, it could be curved, but a linear relationship, it has to be a straight line. So again, uh, this is assuming that the relationship is linear. What does the rate of change represent? So what does it mean when it says two apartments per hour? That's kind of what it's getting at. 
So, uh, choice A would be the correct answer, the number of apartments cleaned after one hour, because as you can see right here, two apartments per hour. That means the amount of apartments cleaned after one hour. Uh, the other ones, whoops, uh, the other one doesn't exactly make sense. Like choice B, it says the number of hours it took to clean one apartment. Uh, yes, that's kind of true, but, um, but I guess it's just like asking for the, the general overview of what it means in this entire situation. And the number of apartments cleaned after one hour, that is exactly what the rate of change means. Uh, part C. Which of the which equation describes the relationship between the time elapsed and the number of apartments cleaned? Uh, very simple question. We're now just being asked to take our graph and figure out what function created it. And basically, remember that rate of change is also your slope. And in slope-intercept form, you have m y equals m x plus b. So if you go back and look at your graph and just see where it crosses the y-axis, you can figure out that b is 0 in that case. And uh, to find the slope, well, the slope was rise over run, and that was 2 over 1. So basically, uh, choice A and B cannot be the right answer because both of those slopes are 1. You have a 1 in front of the x, that means the slope m was 1, and then you have a 1 in front of that x, so the slope was 1. It can't be A or B. And then because choice D has a y-intercept that is starting at 2, uh, it would obviously be zero, 0 hours would have passed when no apartments were cleaned. So it really wouldn't make sense that the y-intercept would be starting at 2. So basically, uh, choice C would be the answer. All right, uh, simple graphing review right now. Um, basically, there are things involving slope-intercept form that we have to remember how to do, so this last part of the video is going to kind of hit some of those major ideas involving slope-intercept form and graphing. Uh, I highly suggest you pause the video and try to do these before I do them because this is all material that we have already done in class. So this last part of the video is going to be a review of that, that stuff. So um, here we go. Uh, graphing y equals 2x plus 3. M and B are 2 and 3. You would graph B, the y-intercept, first. And then the slope M, 2 is the same thing as 2 over 1. So you would rise 2 and you would run 1. But as you can see right below, I did the slope backwards. I went down 2 and I went 1 to the left. And you can always do slope in the reverse direction because it is a pattern that goes both ways. And then you can do the pattern a few more times to get a few more dots. And then there's your line. Uh, consider the equation 2x plus 5y equals 1, part A. How does this equation look different from slope-intercept form of an equation? Well, slope-intercept form um, doesn't have x and y on the same side. So uh, slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. x and y are on the same side in standard form, so that's kind of how they look different. Uh, part B, rewrite the equation in slope-intercept form. Very important problem for you to be able to do. Definitely pause the video and give it a shot. Otherwise, here we go. Uh, to rewrite it in slope-intercept form, you would need to first subtract 2x from both sides so that you can get y on one side, because that's how slope-intercept form looks. y is on one side. So you would have 5y equals, you would want to put the x part first because in slope-intercept form it says mx plus b, so that would be negative 2x, and then you would add 1. And then divide both sides by 5, canceling the 5s out right here, and then uh, negative 2 gets divided by 5, and then 1 gets divided by 5. So your final answer actually, because 2 and 1 are not divisible by 5, you just leave those in fraction form and you get negative 2x plus 1 fifth. Last question, identify the slope and the y-intercept. The slope is negative two-fifths, and the y-intercept is positive one-fifth. All right, a few more questions. Uh, graph the equation that we just got. Uh, basically, when you have fractions within graphs, you can still get the answer. You just, you just get as close as you can to the point that you know you have to be at. So uh, really quickly, um, again, we have our x and y axis, and I'm going to make the x axis counting by fives, and the y axis also counting by fives. This isn't going to look perfect, but it's going to look good enough. Basically, we would want to maybe try to figure out, um, you know, what is our y-intercept going to be. You could plug in 0 for x. The y-intercept is 1 fifth. It's also in the position of position b, so you know it's 1 fifth. 
But the coordinate, 0, 1 fifth, that would be going up the coordinate plane a very, very small amount right there. It's not even halfway to 1, so you can just estimate it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Your slope, though, is 2, uh, two over 5, but it's negative. So that basically means uh, when you rise 2, you could go up 2, but your run... Ooh, whoops, that line went on the wrong side. Let me just quickly edit that. It was a negative slope, so the run is supposed to go to the left. Uh, so you would then go up 2, but then your run, because that is a negative in front of the fraction, your run would have to be negative, and that's why you would need to go to the right. But I know I already programmed this to go to the right, so let me just flip that over to the left. Let's bring this line right there. And then, and then bring this right there. There we go. Uh, so again, because the slope said negative 2 over 5, I rose positive 2, but then I assigned the negative value to the run. It doesn't matter which number is negative, you get the same answer either way. So if I did a rise down of 2, and then a positive 5 as the run, I would still be on the exact same line. So basically, when you have a negative sign in front of a fraction, whatever that fraction may be, either the numerator of that fraction is going to be your, get your negative sign, or the denominator is going to get your negative sign. It doesn't matter which, just one of the numbers has to be negative. All right, moving on. Uh, graph the equation. This equation is in standard form, so what I would recommend you do is you, uh, you do the intercept method for getting, uh, for getting one of your coordinate points. That is where you calculate uh, the x or the y intercept, making either x0 or y0. When you make x0, you're going to get negative 4 times 0 minus 5y equals negative 10, and then negative 4 times 0 would cancel out, leaving you with just the negative 5y. You would then divide both sides by negative 5, and you would get a positive 2 for your y-intercept, so 0, 2 can be plotted. But now we need a second point. So here's something else you could do. Rewrite the equation into slope-intercept form and figure out what the slope is, and then just do rise over run. So you would add 4x to both sides, and you would get negative 5y equals 4x minus 10. You would divide both sides by negative 5, and then you would get y equals 4x over negative 5, but then you can simplify negative 10 over negative 5 to positive 2. The two negative signs cancel out. Let me just back that up so you can see that one more time. The, new, the two negative signs on the negative 10 and negative 5, they cancel out to make a positive, and then 10 divided by 5, well, that's 2. So your slope is 4 over negative 5, Whoops, again, we got another typo. Let me just fix that. Uh, negative 5 right there. It's negative 5. So starting at our dot, we would go up 4, and then because the 5 is now negative, that would be a run to the left by 5. And then the dot would need to go over there as well. And then the line you would get would be flipped around. So let me just flip that around really quickly. Go. All right, a couple more problems, two more to go. Uh, beat the test. Let line T and then triangle ECA and triangle FDB are shown on the grid coordinate grid below. Uh, which of the following statements is true? This is a very important problem for you to try on your own, so please pause the video. Try to select all that apply. Uh, when they're talking about these triangles right here, they're just referring to the triangles that are on this line right here in the problem. So uh, pause the video, try to do this problem, then hit resume. All right, uh, first question, the slope of AC is equal to the slope of BD. You just got to compare the slopes of those two line segments. Well, uh, line AE has a slope of, or has a rise of 3 and a run of 6. So when you find its slope, the rise is 3, the run is 6, so the slope is 1 half. The uh, line BD, we're doing that in purple right now, uh, the rise there is going to be 2, and the run is going to be 4. So 2 over 4 also has a slope of 1 half. 
So that means, yes, those two slopes would be equal. Both of those triangles have diagonal lines that have equal slopes. The second question, the slope of AC is equal to the slope of line T. Well, line T, the green line right there, that is the same line as that piece of uh, AC. So, of course, they have the same slope. They're the same line. The slope of line T is equal to EC over AE. So, line T, as you can see, it's the green line. But let's look at EC. It's that blue line that I just drew. Uh, that's a run number. And line AE, that's a rise number. So, that means the run is over the rise when it's supposed to be the other way around. Rise is supposed to be the numerator. Uh, so, that means uh, EC over AE, that does not equal the slope of line T. That's the inverse. It's the opposite. Uh, part the fourth one though the slope of line T is equal to uh, BF over E uh, over FD uh, I did that in purple right here that one is going to work because the rise was BF as you can see uh, there's line BF it's in it's the, it's that one right there and then line FD that is the run so that means we are in rise over run form so yes that one would apply uh, last one, uh, the y or second to last one, the y intercept of line T is 2. As you can see, I put two yellow dots going up, meaning that the uh, line T is crossing the y axis at 2, so yes. And then the very last question, line T represents a discrete function. The word discrete means a uh, chopped up function in terms of uh, whole numbers. So for example, if you were going uh, with some friends to buy movie tickets, you would only be buying whole number amounts of movie tickets. One ticket, two ticket, three ticket. Um, but if you were going to the store and you were buying pounds of bananas, you could buy 1.4 pounds, 1.5 pounds of bananas. Um, Buying pounds of bananas, that is not discrete because you can get decimals. But when you buy stuff like movie tickets, that would be a whole number increment. So yes, that would be discrete. Because this line is a, um, it's a line that has no separation by dots, it's just a continuous line, it is not discrete. So you would not check the final box. All right, the very last question. Uh, the senior class uh, at Elizabeth High School was selling tickets to raise money for prom. The graph below represents the situation. How much does one ticket cost? Well, as you can see, uh, when, you, when you find the slope, which I already set up right there with some rise over run, you're going to have 100 be your rise, and then 4 be the run, in the case of how I set it up. So that means you're going to have 100 over 4, and that means $25 for one ticket. And then, part B, how much money did the senior class have at the start of the fundraiser? Well, as you can see by the yellow dot right there, the y-intercept is at 100. And that was the starting point. That was the lowest point on the graph. So that means they had $100. Alright guys, so that kind of wraps up a review of the slope-intercept form stuff that you needed to know. Um, you know, the first half of the video was rate of change, second half of the video a review of some things. Any additional questions you have, please come in, and by all means, feel free to go back to one of the earlier questions. Try reworking the problem. Uh, it can definitely help you practice and really get this stuff down. Uh, but until then, I'll see you guys later.